This lecture is the first lecture on social psychology where I'm going to review social cognition and persuasion. So the first part of the lecture is going to be social cognition and the second part of the lecture will be persuasion. Social cognition is the area of social psychology that examines how people perceive and think about their social world. And so I'm going to divide social cognition into talking about, first I'll introduce it, um, and then I'll um, divide it into talking about schemas and heuristics as well as making predictions. And so from this first part of the lecture on social cognition, what I hope you will take away is that you'll learn how we simplify social information to make decisions and navigate our social worlds effectively, Undersca understand what schemas are, including their advantages and disadvantages, and then understand how we make predictions about ourselves and other people in our social world. Okay, so first, just in terms of a definition, social cognition is how people think about themselves, about others, and about the social world. This includes how people select, interpret, remember, and use social information to make judgments and decisions. The assumption that social psychologists have is that people are generally trying to form accurate impressions of the world and to do so most of the time. However, because of the nature of our social thinking, we sometimes form erroneous impressions of other people. So um, we can think about social cognition as being of two types. And uh, quite often we've got, uh, so we've got an automatic as well as a, a controlled way of thinking. And this refers to the way that we think in general, but it also refers to social cognition. So by automatic, we think about quick decision-making without any conscious deliberation our thoughts, our perceptions, or our assumptions. Uh, so we've discussed in previous lectures, this is often referred to as type one thinking. And the second way is to think in a more controlled way, which is characterized as being effortful and deliberate, as thinking carefully about ourselves and the environments that we're in, and carefully selecting the right course of action. Okay, and again, this is how we think in general, but we can also apply this to how we think about ourselves and other people. So quite often, these automatic and controlled modes of social cognition work very well together. Um, our automatic thinking is really like the automatic pilot that flies an airplane, uh, monitoring hundreds of complex systems and, adjust, and adjusts uh, to changes in the atmosphere. That The autopilot, on the airplane does fine most of the time, um, although occasionally it's important for the human pilot to take over and fly, and fly the, the, the plane manually. And so our automatic thinking is much like this automatic pilot, and most of the time we're running an automatic pilot when we monitor our environments, draw conclusions, and uh, direct our behavior. But we do also have the ability to override our automatic type of thinking and analyze the situations and the people that we find in our social situations um, more slowly and uh, deliberate. So we'll begin by uh, examining the nature of automatic thinking. And so an important way to think about automatic thinking is the concept of uh, schemas. So a schema is a mental model or set of beliefs about something. Um, a schema can be a mental model of ourselves. It can be a mental model of other people, in which case it is a stereotype. It can be a mental model of an object, or it can be a mental model of um, how, we, how certain events take place, which are called scripts. So if we didn't have schemas, we would waste a lot of time learning about everything we encountered. So every time you walked into a 
a new classroom building or to the library or to a restaurant, if you didn't have schemas in place for how stuff operated, you'd be spending all kinds of time figuring stuff out. Um, so luckily for us, our schemas tell us that when we go in a classroom, as a for example, um, we usually find a seat, we usually wait for the instructor to begin class, we generally uh, wait to talk until it's our turn, there's often other rules for engagement, like we raise our hand when we want to speak. So um, having these schemas for what appropriate behavior looks like in a classroom setting, as just one example, is very functional and helps us navigate our social worlds. Um, okay, so um, schemas are typically very useful for helping organize and make sense of the world and also to fill in gaps in our understanding when we don't have all the information or have um, a complete picture. And schemas can be particularly important when encountering information that can be interpreted in a number of ways because schemas, that is our understanding, our models for the way things work, help reduce ambiguity. Um, so let's just do an activity really quick and then I'll come back to the idea of schemas. So I'm going to read some text and I just want you to kind of listen to the text as I'm reading it. Okay, so it's a, just a little bit of a story. So, Nancy woke up feeling sick again and wondered if she was really pregnant. How would she tell the man she had been seeing and the money was another problem? Nancy went to the doctor. She arrived at the office and checked in with the receptionist. She went to see the nurse who went through the usual procedures. Then Nancy stepped on the scale and the nurse recorded her weight the doctor entered the room and examined the results. The doctor smiled at Nancy and said, well, it seems my expectations have been confirmed. When the examination was finished, Nancy left the office. Okay, so we'll come back to that in just a little bit. But schemas are useful because they help simplify our social world by serving as memory guides. So because we have schemas that are expectations, expectations for other people, expectations for the way that events go, for scripts, they help us fill in the blanks when trying to remember things. So what happens is that we remember some information that is there because uh, our schemas have us pay particular attention to information. Um, our schema, we particularly, uh, we pay attention to information to which our schemas lead us to pay more attention to. So that is information that is consistent with our schema. We also remember other information that was never there before. So, so that's a problem with schemas, so that we unknowingly add information that is also consistent with our schema. All right, so let's return to our activity. And what I want you to do is just think about to yourself whether any of the following statements from the story are true. All right, so the first one is that Nancy took a pregnancy test at home. What about the nurse administered a pregnancy test at the office? What about the doctor told Nancy the result of the pregnancy test? And then Nancy was nervous about sharing the news with her boyfriend. Okay. So you can think about whether these were statements from the story. Let's take a look at the first one. Nancy took a pregnancy test at home. This was not in the story. If you go back and read it, you'll see that that wasn't there. The next one was that the nurse administered the pregnancy test at the office. Also, not in the story. Nothing specifically was mentioned about a pregnancy test. It just said that the nurse went through the usual procedures. The next one is that the doctor told Nancy the result of the pregnancy test. 
Again, whether she actually took a pregnancy test was not mentioned, nor was a specific result. And then uh, the last one, Nancy was nervous about sharing the news with her boyfriend. Um, uh, whether or not she was nervous about sharing the news with a boyfriend wasn't mentioned. The story just referred specifically to the man she had been seeing. So if you were tempted to say that these were specific elements or statements of the story, these this is your schema or these are your schemas at play. So based on the ambiguous story that was presented, these are all elements that would seem to fit because they match our schema. They match our schema of perhaps a young woman who has a pregnancy scare, wakes up, gets a, a positive result, is nervous about it, worried about telling her boyfriend, goes to the doctors, gets a, a nurse to administer a pregnancy test to try to confirm it. So, so we are filling in the gaps with information that isn't actually there based on the schema that we have for this social information in this social event. So that's just an example of how our schemas work. And again, sometimes for the better, but sometimes our schemas can lead us to erroneous conclusions. Let's do a couple other examples from, uh, the, from research in psychology about how schemas can affect our perceptions. So this comes from a classic study by Kelly in 1950. And so what he did was have two groups of students observe the same lecture, but, um, and these were students in an economic class, economics class. Uh, they were told that a guest lecture would be filling in for that day. Um, the researcher told students that the, the econ department was interested in how different classes would react to different instructors and that students would receive a brief biographical note about the instructor before the instructor arrived. And so the note contained information about the instructor's age, background, teaching experience, and personality. However, one version um, said that uh, people who know this instructor consider him to be a rather cold person, industrious, critical, practical, and determined. The other version was identical, except that the phrase rather cold was replaced with very warm. Okay, So the guest lecturer then conducted a class discussion for 20 minutes, and the students rated their impressions of him. So the question was, how did they rate the instructor's overall performance arrogance, and sense of humor when these two different classes who heard the same lecture and, and got the same uh, person, but were given these two different descriptions. So here's what the research found. The instructor received higher performance ratings when he was described as warm versus cold. And this was explained by using a schema. Students who expected the instructor to be warm asked more questions and participated more than when the instructor was described as cold. So students' schemas guided them and they acted differently and so indeed the instructor might have performed better because uh, students acted differently towards that instructor. <laughs> Turns out that arrogance was rated the same in both conditions because it was an unambiguous trait the instructor was quite self-confident, and because that was not ambiguous, they didn't need to rely on their schemas to fill in the blanks. And then sense of humor, because sense of humor was a more ambiguous personality trait, the lecturer was rated as funnier in the warm condition compared to the cold condition. Why? Because people that are warm, that are pleasant, that are nice, uh, that, that, that's a positive trait. And so is sense of humor. That's a positive trait. And so it just seems likely that somebody who's uh, warm would also have a better sense of humor. So as you're using an overall impression as a schema to then fill in the blanks about these ambiguous traits. So what the research concluded is that when we have ambiguous information, we use schemas to fill in the blanks. All right. So another way that we simplify our 
social world, in addition to the use of schemas, are called heuristics. And we've learned about heuristics in the past. Heuristics are mental shortcuts. One particular heuristic that we use is the representative heuristic. This is a mental shortcut in which the likelihood of an object belonging to a category is evaluated based on the extent to which the object appears similar to one's mental representation of the category. You might remember the Linda problem from a previous lecture on judgment and decision making, where people often make the conjunction fallacy and ignore base rates because um, the profile of Linda was this person in the in the problem was presented as representative of uh, being a feminist. So um, that's one shortcut that we use. Another shortcut that we use is the availability heuristic. This is a mental shortcut where people base a judgment on the ease to which they can bring something to mind. Because commonly occurring events are more likely to be uh, the, the language is cognitively accessible. That means it comes to mind more easily. Availability, the availability heuristic can, in some circumstances, lead to relatively good um, guesses or approximations of frequency. However, sometimes using the availability heuristic is not reliable because sometimes very infrequent events are highly accessible. Okay, so, um, and we've, uh, let me go back, we've learned about the use of the availability heuristic in the past um, in kind of our everyday thinking. People are much more likely to think that, um, uh, for example, dying in a plane crash is more common than other uh, more routine uh, ways of, of, of passing like the flu because it's much more easily accessible. It's more easy to, to come to mind or um, uh, say like homicide uh, by fire firearm or something like that is much more easy to come to mind. And so people um, skew their judgments about um, what's more common. But interestingly, we, we do this with ourselves. So we can use the, the availability heuristic to make self-judgments. And so there's a research study that demonstrated this by Schwartz and colleagues in 1991. They had participants remember either six or 12 examples of their own past assertive behaviors. Specifically, people were asked to think of... Um, uh, six examples where they had been assertive in the past and another set of people had been, uh, were asked to write down 12 different examples where they had been assertive in the past. So for people that thought of six examples, they rated themselves as relatively assertive. And the reason is, is because it was relatively easy to think of this many examples. And so in terms of a self-judgment, when thinking about, hey, am I an assertive person or not? It, it was easily available to have six examples of past assertive behavior. So people are relying on the availability heuristic and saying, yeah, there's six times I was assertive. I must be a, an assertive person. Alternatively, it's more difficult to think of 12 examples. So once you get to like six examples or seven examples or eight examples, it's like, wow, I'm having a tough time thinking of nine examples or 10 examples, or I could barely even think of 12 at all. Like that's tough. So because that is difficult to bring to mind, that is, it is not easily accessible, people rated themselves as relatively unassertive compared to participants in the six example group. Okay, and so again, because it was hard, because it was not available or accessible in the mind, they rated themselves as not being a very assertive person. So the availability heuristic uh, comes into play even when we're uh, making judgments about ourselves. Okay, and here's just a graph of those results. All right, what about first impressions? Um, turns out we can make fairly accurate predictions based on a small amount of information. 
generally, the more information we have, the more accurate our predictions. However, we can be accurate based on a small amount of data. And we often make predictions based on our first impressions, which is on, based on our initial exposure to someone or something. Um, however, given that sometimes our first impressions are wrong, our, abil our ability to make predictions based on our first impressions can be problematic. All right, so take a look at this person in the mugshot. Um, if, you know, you don't know the identity of this person, what is your first impression? Is this person a devious criminal mastermind, an armed robber, a jaywalker, a drug dealer? Um, what, what is your impression of this person? Why might this person have a mugshot? Okay, so just based on this picture, some impression is coming into mind, okay? What could this person possibly have done? What crimes would this a person who looked like this be capable of? Uh, would this person be capable of physical violence? Would this person be um, more like a criminal mastermind? Kind of looks maybe a little nerdy, perhaps. Um, so, or would this person just be in for a minor offense? Turns out that's a mugshot of Bill Gates, and uh, he was at, this mug, mugshot was actually taken in 1977 because he was arrested for a traffic violation um, in in Albuquerque. So don't quite know the backstory on that, but I thought it was kind of hilarious. But um, just that simple mugshot alone, everybody I'm sure formed an impression of some kind or another. It turns out we form initial impressions based on a facial experience, a, a facial appearance, sorry, just like the one you saw in less than one tenth of a second. Interestingly, limited exposure can lead to meaningful first impressions of abilities as well as personalities. And in social psychology, this is called thin slice judgments which means that people can draw meaningful conclusions about another person's personality or skills based on an extremely brief sample of behavior. To give you a research example, a research team uh, had participants, had uh, students uh, rate three random 10 second video clips from 12 instructor, instructors lectures. They removed the audio track so that um, students were only looking at a silent video. And so these were just three random 10 second clips taken from an, an entire lecture. And student participants rated these clips um, for 12 different instructors. What the researchers then did was compare the ratings of the video clips to the end of semester teaching evaluations from students that were actually in the class. So not the research participants, but the actual teaching evaluations from students in the class. The research participants ratings of a teacher's warmth, enthusiasm, and attentiveness predicted that was, it means it was correlated to, te to the teacher's final student evaluations. So kind of amazing actually that people that are not in the class but see these very short, thin slices of an uh, instructor's lecture and can see the behavior are able to provide ratings that correlate and can even predict how other students that were in the class evaluated the instructor being in that class all semester. So research evidence that we are able to form fairly reliable first impressions on um, as well as make um, good predictions about people based on thin slices of data. Why do first impressions linger? There's a couple different reasons. The first has to do with something called the primacy effect. So when it comes to forming first impressions, the first traits we perceive in others influence how we uh, view information that we learn about them later. So those, uh, essentially, we 
we take in that information and that forms a schema that forms an impression, that forms an expectation. So then all other information that we take in is viewed through that lens of those initial um, traits that we perceive in them. And that's compounded by the phenomenon of belief perseverance, which is that we generally have a tendency to stick with an initial judgment, even in the face of new information that would prompt us to consider. So unfortunately, um, if we're miscategorized by others, that's a bad thing because in general, people aren't so great about changing their impressions of others. It has to do with not wanting to feel wrong and experience, experiencing the dissonance and feeling like, oh, I could have been wrong by misjudging people. So we're, we're kind of motivated to for our um, beliefs to persevere um, and that includes the impressions that we make of other people. Okay, so those are impressions of other people, but what about ourselves? Social psychologists have come up with the term affective forecasting, which is predicting how we will feel in the future after some event or decisions. Like first impressions, affective forecasting has its own predict prediction issues. The first has to do with impact bias, which is the tendency for a person to overestimate the intensity or the strength of the emotion that they will feel in the future. So for example, research has shown that people's predictions about how they would feel following a positive event, like winning the lottery, which is pictured in the lower left, or following a negative event, like getting a bad grade on an exam, tends to be overestimated compared to people who actually experience those events. So in other words, when you look at people that actually win the lottery, they are not nearly as happy as people say they would be if they would win the lottery. Or when you actually look at how unhappy people are after not doing well on an, on an exam, they're not nearly as unhappy as people uh, estimate that they would be. So the impact bias has to do with we tend to overestimate how happy or how sad or generally how emotional we will feel after an event, more so than we actually do. Relatedly, there's a durability bias. Okay, and so this is the tendency for people to overestimate how long a positive or negative event will affect one. Okay, so how long they'll feel the emotion after the event. So for example, when asked how long people are likely to feel bad if their boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with them, people will say or they'll estimate that they will feel bad for a longer period of time than they actually would due to the durability bias. It turns out that the durability bias is much greater for predictions about negative events than for um, positive events. In other words, um, we if something bad if we if we think that something bad will happen to us in the future, we tend to believe that we will feel bad for for much longer um, than we would if we are expecting a positive event to happen. Um, we don't necessarily expect that we'll feel as good after a positive event for as long as we would feel bad after a negative event. Um, and, and some of this has to do with we generally underestimate and are unaware of how good we are at coping with difficulty. So when there's stress and when there's hardship or whether there's, whether there's loss, um, we don't often think we're as resilient or as good as coping as we actually are. And so we overestimate, especially for negative events, how long we're going to feel bad. And then, of course, that's coupled with the impact bias of just how bad we will feel. So knowing that those are two biases that affect you, hopefully that is somewhat happy news, at least for negative events, is that when negative events happen, you're likely going to feel less affected and for less long than you predict that you will. The downside, of course, is that for happy events, 
you're likely to not feel happy for nearly as long um, as you think that you will. Which is why it can be sometimes a bit of a letdown if you've been waiting or looking forward or, or anticipating some good news or happy news. It can sometimes be a, a letdown that you just don't feel as happy as you predicted that you would or that happy feeling goes away sooner than you thought. Um, so I guess one take home is just keep your expectations uh, modest. All right, so that was the first part about social cognition. Let's move on to the second part of the lecture, which is about persuasion. Uh, persuasion is, is one of the most studied of all social psychological phenomenon, and it's the process by which messages cause us to change our beliefs, our attitudes, or our behaviors. So I'm going to go over some definitions uh, talk about a prominent model of persuasion in the social psychology field, um, uh, go over trustworthiness and manipulating perceptions of trustworthiness because that's one of the main reasons that we're persuaded by people is that we find them trustworthy. Talk about some tricks of persuasion and then how to defend ourselves against persuasion. So after hearing this part of the lecture, I hope that you'll know the difference between the central and peripheral routes of persuasion understand the concepts of trigger features, fixed action patterns, and heuristics, how these processes allow us to be persuaded, understand some of the common uh, tricks of persuasion that persuasion artists use to take advantage of us, and then use this knowledge to make you less susceptible to unwanted persuasion. All right, just a couple uh, definitions. An attitude is a positive or negative evaluation of a person object or idea, and persuasion is the process by which a mes message induces, that is, causes change in belief, attitudes, or behaviors. Um, I like to think about the ABCs of attitudes. So we say that attitudes are made up of three parts that together form our evaluation of the attitude object, that is, whatever we have an attitude about. So there's an affective component, a behavioral component, and a cognitive component in A, B, and a C. The affective component consists of your emotional reactions towards whatever the attitude object is. The uh, behavioral component consists of your actions or observable behaviors towards that attitude object. And then the cognitive component is your thoughts and beliefs. Um, so certainly it, with the behavior, there, there's how we act towards or in response to something that we have an attitude about. Um, but I think one good separation is to think about attitudes that are more affectively based or are more cognitively based. That is, we can have attitudes that are more emotionally based or more cognitively based. And as a guide to think about which attitudes are more likely to be affectively based, that is grounded in emotion, you might think about some of the, the topics that an etiquette manual would tell you you shouldn't talk about at, say, a family holiday dinner. Um, like you want to avoid, or, or when you get to know people for the first time, you want to avoid talking about politics or religion. Um, you know, it's that people tend to be very emotional when it comes to these things, um, especially in kind of the divisive political climate that we have now. Many people's attitudes are really based in emotion, and you get strong reactions. Um, on the other hand, if we think about kind of the other end of the continuum, um, if people have an attitude that is primarily cognitively based, it's really based about uh, on the facts or um, uh, properties of that particular attitude object. So rather than thinking about like religion or politics or like social values, which are affectively based, think about your attitudes maybe towards like different consumer products, like a, a laptop or a smartphone. Um, your attitude, that is like how favorably or disfavorably or what you think about something is, is going to be more cognitively based. You're relying primarily on like the features and the functionality of, um, of that particular uh, product is a basis for your attitude. Okay. Another distinction we can talk about is that attitudes can be either explicit or implicit. So explicit attitudes are those that we consciously endorse 
and that we can easily and directly report. So in previous lectures, we've talked about um, a self-report methodology for having people um, tell researchers about their personality. Um, a self-report methodology is one that we can apply towards understanding people's attitudes. And that rely about anything, really, about politics, about social values, about, um, uh, about, about their social world. And so some of the attitudes that people have are ones that they're consciously aware of. Um, but hopefully in this course, you've also come to appreciate that there's many things that we have in our brains that are not necessarily, that we're not necessarily conscious of, that we're not self-aware of. So implicit attitudes are um, attitudes that are involuntary, uncontrollable, and at times unconscious. And so one good way to distinguish explicit and implicit attitudes, particularly as it, as it refers to social cognition, is to think about um, beliefs about other, uh, say, races of people. Um, and that in our society, it is generally frowned upon to be prejudiced or to discriminate against others, to hold stereotypes of others. And so our explicit attitudes, for most people, at least in the United States, are that um, we, we tend to believe that people are equal. We tend to believe that people um, have an equal amount of um, ability or desirable characteristics or whatever it is. And we explicitly, that is, we consciously know that it would be wrong or inappropriate to feel any differently, to hold discriminatory uh, or stereotypical beliefs. However, what we know from research in psychology is that even when people explicitly would like consciously self-report that they do not hold any racist or prejudiced beliefs, when you find a way to measure their implicit attitudes, we find that they often do. Is that lurking underneath the surface, people might harbor prejudiced beliefs about other groups. Um, and that's something that we'll discuss in a subsequent lecture. All right, so I want to talk about the one of the primary models that social psychologists have used to study persuasion. This model is called the elaboration likelihood model. And persuasion theorists distinguish between two routes, two paths to persuasion, the central route and the peripheral route. So the central route to persuasion suggests that people elaborate on a message by listening carefully and thinking about the arguments, okay? So if I'm trying to persuade you, if I'm trying to take the central route to persuasion, what I'm believing is, is that you're gonna listen and carefully think about what I'm saying to you, what my arguments are, and you're gonna elaborate on those arguments. You're gonna think about those arguments more. With a peripheral route, People don't elaborate on the arguments in a persuasive communication, but are influenced by peripheral cues. Peripheral meaning outside of the central message. So not listening to the actual message or not listening to the actual arguments, but relying on other factors. Okay, so the central route assumes that people will be motivated to pay attention and think. And so with that in mind, the arguments in your message should be relevant, they should be logical, they should be factual, they should make sense. The central route to persuasion is intended to produce enduring agreement, that is lasting agreement with your message. So this is the, the approach that's taken by educators. This is the approach that I'm trying to take is that I'm assuming that you're motivated to pay attention and I'm trying to persuade you about the value of psychology in your life. So I'm taking the central route and I'm trying to present relevant, logical, and factual information. Alternatively, the peripheral route to persuasion assumes, or in some cases relies on the fact that people are not motivated to think very hard. And so the peripheral route relies on superficial cues that have little to do with logic. The peripheral route exploits common sense 
in order to trigger mindless reactions. So I'll discuss later in the lecture that there's many tricks of persuasion that are used by salespeople, and they rely on this peripheral route. Um, as another example, many advertisements might show celebrities or cute animals, beautiful scenery that have nothing to do with the, the product. They're not trying to sell you about on the futures of the product. They're just trying to use these other factors to create a positive attitude and make you more persuadable. Okay, so the peripheral route would use other factors like the source of the message um, as a way to get you to not really pay attention to what's being said, but just have you make your decision based on some other factor. Okay, so the central route, or something that kind of underlies the central route, is that people do have to be motivated to be able to pay attention to and understand the arguments in a persuasive communication. So when are people going to be motivated to pay attention? The first factor has to do with the personal relevance of whatever the whatever the topic is. So how important is whatever the, the message or the argument or the communication, how important is it to a person's life, their well-being? The more personally relevant, the more it affects them, them personally, the more people will pay attention. So knowing that, you need to have a good, well-constructed message if people are going to be motivated to pay attention because it matters for them. A second factor would be people's need for cognition. So this is a personality trait. Um, need for People that are high in the need for cognition generally enjoy thinking hard. Okay, There's other people that are lower in the need for cognition. They generally don't prefer to think quite as hard about most things in the world. Okay, So that would be another uh, individual difference. Some people are just uh, for anything and everything, they're just more motivated to think hard, pay attention, scrutinize arguments, solve problems, etc. All right. So, so those are those are um, uh, a couple factors. A couple more are we have to consider somebody's ability to pay attention. So, if we're persuading via the central route, that we've got a good argument, we want people to listen to it and pay attention. People first need to have the intellectual ability to do so, is that you can have a very strong message, but if people don't understand it because they don't have the intellectual ability to do so, they will not be persuaded. People, of course, also need to have the time to, to hear the message, and they need to lack, there needs to be a lack of distractions. In other words, you know, attention, paying attention to the message is important, so there can't be distractions for the central route to work. Okay, alternatively, um, the, uh, where at, we can say whereas the central route emphasizes facts and objective information, the peripheral route relies on psychological techniques. And these techniques take advantage of our um, automatic responses, our automatic thinking. Um, and this mirrors a phenomenon in animal behavior known as fixed action patterns, which are sequences of behavior that occur exactly the same way every time they're elicited. So it's kind of, you can think of this as like a habit strength, is that we have these kind of built-in ingrained habits and these become um, triggers for action. So here's an example. Um, there's a study by uh, psychologists that um, had people wait in a <clears throat> crowded line to use a copy machine in the library. So at the researchers' um, college, that was just something that, that happened on a regular basis. This was back in the days that people needed to use a copy machine regularly. And so when the copy machine was very busy and there was a long line, they, they um, uh, did a couple things. So in the first condition, the experimenter walked up to the front of the line and asked for a favor and said, excuse me, I have five pages to copy. May I use the copy machine? Okay. And 60% of people who were in that first position in, the, in waiting in line agreed with the request, which is pretty good. I mean, to just like 
walk up to the front of the line, 60 people said yes, that's pretty good. But consider what happened next. They, uh, in a second condition, they said that exact same thing, but they added a reason for the request. Okay, they said this, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the copy machine because I'm in a rush? Okay, so there's a reason. And the only reason is because I'm in a rush. This time, nearly everyone, 94%, let the person get in line in front of them. Okay, so the, the rate went from 60% to 94%. Um, so it would be nice to think of people as just being nice, but not necessarily. In another condition, a new reason was substituted, one that made no sense at all. And so the in a third condition, the experimenter said, excuse me, I have five pages. May I uh, use the copy machine because I have to make some copies? Uh, yeah, no duh. Okay. But here again, nearly everybody, 93% agreed. So the researchers explain this behavior by suggesting that the trigger phrase, because, uh, initiates a fixed action pattern. It turns on this, this on switch that because there's a reason, we kind of like automatically are inclined to say, oh, there's, there's a reason. Yes, of course. And interestingly enough, the reason doesn't even need to be that compelling. Like because I'm in a rush or because I need to make copies. So um, who knows? Try it out for yourself. All right. So kind of staying on this peripheral route, what the peripheral route says is that we'll be less motivated to pay attention to the exact arguments of the message as much as factors outside of the message. And one of the most important kind of factors outside of the message is who's giving the message, the source of persuasion. And what the persuasion um, literature tells us is that they're... Um, Really effective persuasion requires trusting the source of the message. So people use this peripheral route and not pay close attention to the message if they trust the source. And so research has identified three characteristics in people that lead to trust. Their perceived authority, their honesty, and their likability. And when a source appears to have any or all of these characteristics, people will be more willing to agree with their requests and um, agree with their messages and communications without carefully, carefully considering all the arguments or facts. So let's talk about each one of these just a bit more. The first characteristic is authority. Authority signifies status, power, as well as expertise. Um, from our earliest childhood experiences, we rely on authority figures for guidance because they know more about the world than we do. Um, so there's authority figures like parents and teachers um, that are sources of guidance and wisdom, but of course also control access to what children want and need. So we develop a um, healthy respect for authorities uh, because they know more, as children they know more than us and they're able to give us things. So as adults, it's natural to transfer this respect um, onto the designated authorities that we have in, in society, judges and doctors and our religious leaders, our political leaders, sometimes our bosses. Um, and so we assume that because our leaders are in these positions or that authority figures are in these positions, it gives them some special access to information that we don't necessarily have. So we often end up deferring to these authority figures because it's a convenient shortcut for, for getting all the facts ourselves, right? We're using this heuristic, this mental shortcut to say, hey, our, our, our authority figures must have more information than we do. Um, but of course, this can be problematic because not all authority figures are necessarily benevolent authorities um, or benevolent leaders. Um, it's also the case that there are, and there are I think several present day examples of this, where our current leaders 
and authorities are not necessarily well informed. And so um, taking the advice of authorities without questioning it can it sometimes be problematic. And then of course people also pose as authority figures um, and, and, and do things that are that are not legitimate. So okay. But um, as one point in the triangle, um, being an authority would it engenders trust. Okay, the second thing, the next characteristic is honesty. So honesty, you can kind of think about as the moral dimension of trustworthiness. And marketing professionals dedicate a lot of money to develop um, and maintain an image of honesty because they know that a trusted brand or company name becomes a mental shortcut for consumers. It signals that you're in safe hands or in, in, in good territory. So there's thousands, tens of thousands of consumer products that come out each year. Um, and, you know, part of the way that um, uh, companies try to get people to buy their products is to create an honest and trustworthy brand in the marketplace. All right, and then finally, we have the characteristic of likability. More than any single quality, we trust people that we like. Um, and so this has to do with, I've got a slide here of some of the most likable celebrities out there today. This isn't just my opinion. I got it from a list. Um, and so we generally tend to trust people that we like. Uh, the mix of qualities that makes a person likable is complex. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily generalize from one situation to another. One clear finding, however, is that physically attractive people tend to be liked more. Okay, so we like people that are physically attractive. Um, and in fact, various studies have shown that we perceive attractive people to be smarter, kinder, stronger, more successful, more socially skilled, um, even having a higher moral char character. This explains in some part why even though celebrities aren't experts, uh, and we, in fact, know that they're being paid to appear in advertisements. They're still used to endorse and sell many products. Ultimately, it's because we like celebrities. Many of us like celebrities. And I would argue, especially in the United States, we have a celebrity-based culture um, that, you know, we, we see these people. They're successful. They're charismatic. They are attractive. This causes us to like them, and we are easily persuaded by those that we like, including celebrities. Okay, so how else do we manipulate per perceptions, or how do we manipulate perceptions of trustworthiness? Okay, so we know that effective persuasion depends on perceiving a source as being trustworthy, and this comes from perceptions of authority, believing that they're honest and liking them. So how do we use that to our advantage? So here's a couple ways. Through testimonials and endorsements, presenting the message of education through word of mouth and the concept of the maven. All right, so I had just previously mentioned the use of celebrities for endorsements, but of course we also use personal testimonials as techniques to persuade people to purchase a product or a service or believe in a message. Um, and the, the intent is to manipulate us by having a seemingly trustworthy representative deliver a, a message. And that kind of, you know, subverts our, our, our suspicions. So the idea here is that with a celebrity endorsement, which is pictured here, it, uh, celebrity endorsements are meant to imply that if we start using the advertised product, we kind of will become a member of the, the club and we'll get all these, you know, uh, the, the glamorous rewards of being in the celebrity club merely by association. Okay, so I'm going to use the same phone service as Mark Wahlberg or the same makeup as Beyonce or, uh, or whatever it is. So I can kind of, uh, by association, um, uh, 
glean on to, uh, some of that. Okay, another technique um, to try to instill trust is to present a message as education. Um, and so often a message will be framed as objective information to kind of divert attention away from a sales pitch. And so, for example, a salesperson might try to convey the impression that they're primarily interested in helping you make the most informed decision. Um, and so, you know, the implicit message is that if you're truly confident, once you fully understand the value of the product, um, the product will sell itself. They're simply the messenger. And so this technique is often used by people that sell nutritional supplements and, and health products. Okay, like I'm just trying to give you all the information about how good this is going to be. I'm not trying to sell you something. I'm just trying to give you all the information about the benefits of this product. And the idea is that by presenting the message as, as education, you think to yourself, oh, okay, well, this person must be honest. They're not trying to sell me something. They're trying to educate me. Okay, and so that engenders trust, which then makes it more easy to um, persuade folks. Okay, another way to instill trust is by word of mouth. And so word of mouth has a powerful influence on our decisions. Um, indeed, we rely on our family members, our friends, um, people we know, uh, people that we already have an established sense of trust to give us adv advice about things that are new. Um, so, um, you know, if you're looking for a recommendation on a restaurant, um, or maybe you need to get a, uh, an auto repair or something like that, we'll use, we'll use word of mouth. It's like, Hey, what mechanic did you go to? Did you, did you trust them? We're more likely to be persuaded by people that we trust. And so if we get a recommendation from a friend, friend or family member, we'll trust them. Um, and indeed, 70% research has shown, polls have shown that 70% of Americans rely on personal advice for selecting a new doctor. 91% um, have said that they're likely to use another person's recommendation when major, making a major purchase. So indeed, research shows that um, people do rely on personal advice and word of mouth when making, making important decisions um, and making major purchases. But, um, and of course, we also rely on public opinions that we perceive to be um, objective. So even going to the grocery store, um, seeing somebody um, and asking people like, hey, have you, ever, have you ever bought this product or have you ever eaten this food or what do you think about this? Um, th that, um, you know, that's, that's word of mouth. So the thing is that persuasion professionals, so marketers, look for ways to exploit our reliance on these word of mouth recommendations. Um, and sometimes they'll actually pay for surveys and use the data to disguise their message as word of mouth insights. Um, so marketing firms will hire people to pose online as fans of a product um, that helps boost the stats or promote it in different, um, like the comment section. Um, so th there's ways that that can be exploited. Um, a related idea and a final technique that I'll tell you about is to use key social figures to manipulate perceptions of trustworthiness. So, um, this relies on the concept of the maven. The Yiddish word maven refers to an expert or connoisseur. So this is a friend that can give good advice, um, about, uh, about something like where's the best restaurant to eat at or where can you find a fair mechanic? Um, you know, where can you get a good deal? So a maven is somebody that knows a lot of people, communicates with a lot of people, um, is more likely to be asked for their opinion, enjoys spreading the word. Um, in other words, this is something that's well connected and trusted because they're always you know, have an ear out for, you know, new information and getting a good deal. Um, so um, advertisers rely on this. And sometimes to avoid formal advertising, marketers will target people to act 
in the role of a maven and that kind of plant the seed to spread their their message. And so what you need to do is find somebody that can be a maven because they're socially connected to a lot of people. Um, so one place that we see this is among social influencers. So people that have popular YouTube, Instagram, or other social media sites, there'll be companies that essentially have these people do product uh, plugs or product endorsements. And the idea is that this person, because we view this person as a socially connected maven in their particular field, whether it's health and nutrition or whether it's um, vacation, leisure, relaxation, uh, beauty products, whatever it is, um, we're, we're trusting that person to be a maven and be socially connected and give us the best advice. But instead, what's happening is they're being paid to give endorsements. So uh, companies are relying on that that concept of the maven when they do that, among, um, using social influencers to do product endorsements. All right. There are several tricks of persuasion, quite a few, so I'm going to go through them. And so these are things to either be on the lookout or that you can potentially use for yourself. Okay. So the first principle here when we talk about tricks of persuasion is reciprocity. And this is reciprocity is one of the most powerful social norms. And the basic idea is that um, we are motivated by a sense of equity and fairness. And so when somebody does something nice for us, we feel compelled to return the favor in some form. Um, so um, it's this idea that what goes around comes around. And if we're benefited, we want to we want to give that benefit um, back. If somebody does us a favor, you know, based on the principle of reciprocity, we, we want to do that favor back. Um, but so um, this can um, you'll, you'll see this, this rule or this norm of reciprocity in play when people try to get us to buy things. Um, so for example, um, you'll see it, uh, when a store offers a free gift or gives a discount in order to get us in the door. Um, and the idea is that hopefully you'll become a return customer because you've gotten something, okay, like a discount or a gift. Um, or like you might decide to use an auto mechanic who will give you a free oil change or a tire rotation if you do a service that is over $100. Or you might go to a coffee stand or a sandwich shop that gives you a punch card that you get a, a free sandwich or free coffee after 10 purchases. Um, or you might, you know, give a suggested donation to charity um, if there's a fundraiser that puts on a free concert. So the idea is, is that we're kind of more willing to spend our dollars and continue to spend our dollars if we're kind of getting something in, in addition. And so this is, this is um, people that are relying on this norm of reciprocity. Okay, a second principle is, is that of social proof, which is the mental shortcut based on the assumption that if everyone is doing it, it must be right. So social proof is essentially following the crowd. Um, and um, just as a couple examples, we might be persuaded to eat at a restaurant that is always, is, that is always busy. And so, you know, I, I have to say I do this. I look at restaurant ratings on Yelp to decide if it's worth my time to eat there. Um, putting that sticker on your chest that says I voted or wherever you put your sticker when you vote is, is again, relying on social proof. It's the idea that we're going to persuade people to get out and vote because uh, other people are doing it, social proof. So this really relies on two powerful social forces, social comparison and conformity. We compare our behavior to what others are doing. And if there's a discrepancy between what others are doing and ourselves, we feel a pressure to change. Um, that's just by nature of the fact that we are social animals. We compare it each other, ourselves to others and particularly others in our own kind of in-group or reference group. And when our behavior is different or discrepant, we feel a pressure to conform. So that's how social proof works. So another technique 
uh, relies on the idea of commitment and consistency, which is the foot in the door technique. So the idea here is that somebody that is trying to persuade you of something gives you an initial, an initial difficult to refuse small request that leads to progressively larger requests that were really the target from the very beginning. Okay. And so you might notice this the last time that you went out shopping or were even walking around campus. People that want you to sign a petition or even donate money might start with a very difficult to refuse small request, which is, excuse me, may I have a moment of your time? It's just a little small request. May I have a moment of your time? They don't lead with, would you be willing to sign these five petitions that I, that I have? Or they don't start with, would you be willing to donate to this charity? They start with, could I please have a moment of your time? It's that initial, very difficult to refuse, small request. But of course, we all know it's coming. It's the larger request. And some of us have gotten very good and very callous at just saying, no, you can't, you can't have a moment of my time because I know it's coming. But still, they're relying on the foot in the door technique. Um, and this is generally because people in the United States and Western cultures tend to prefer consistent behavior. Uh, once we make an initial commitment, like, sure, you can have a moment of my time, we'll be more likely to agree to subsequent commitments that follow from the first. Okay, so um, foot in the door technique. Now there's uh, kind of a uh, a variation. It's uh, we'll say it's a variation of um, that is called the door in the face technique. So the door in the face technique, we'll say I'll, I guess it, I'll call it an inversion of the the foot in the door technique. So it's also called the reject then compromise tactic. Here the persuader begins with a large request, knowing that it's going to get rejected. And then once the request has been refused, the persuader kind of adopts a sympathetic tone and then follows up with a smaller, more reasonable request, which, unknown to the target, was the actual goal all along. Okay, so think about this. If you're approached on campus and asked to do a two-hour survey, how many of you would be willing to do this? Well, what about just a 15-minute important portion of that survey? So in one study, this is exactly what researchers did. They asked college students that were walking on campus if they'd be willing to fill out a 15-minute survey about safety in the home or in the, in the dorm room. Most of the students declined. Only 25% of students, when phrased as, hey, could you fill out this 15-minute survey, only 25% agreed. However, in a different condition of the experiment, the researchers used the door in the face technique and they began with the two hour survey. So they said, hey, would you be willing to do this two hour survey? Almost all of the subjects declined, of course, and then the request was amended to do the actual 15 minute survey. In this case, nearly 50% of the students were likely to cooperate. So that it's the same 15-minute survey, but by saying, hey, would you do the two-hour survey, saying no, then the 15-minute survey doesn't seem nearly as bad. And this also relies on the fact that people generally want to be nice people, so we feel bad by turning down the initial request. And so if there is a smaller request in kind of reference to the big one, people are more likely to, to agree. So door in the face. All right. Um, there's another. There's a technique called the "that's not all," which is a variation of this door in the face technique. So instead of leading with a request that will be rejected outright, as in the door in the face, the "that's not all" approach works by giving a customer a moment of indecision and then making a second offer, which is usually better. So the technique begins with the salesperson attempting to hook the listener with a hypothetical high price. 
Okay, and then this is followed by several seconds pause during which the customer is kept from responding. Then the salesperson offers a better surprise deal by either lowering the price or add, adding a bonus product or both. Okay, and so this is used uh, quite a bit in um, infomercials, which are not so popular today, but I uh, have a hyperlink there that you can see um, some of the infomercials. So prior to the days of, of Netflix, when you actually had to watch TV late night, very late night television was uh, notorious for just doing these infomercials, where, which are essentially uh, extended commercials. And then there's different pitch people. Like we got this guy, Billy Mays, that sold OxyClean and other types of products. But they're known for doing these, these pitches. How much would you expect to pay for this product? How much would you expect to pay for this, this knife? $300, $200, then pause. Well, guess what? It's only uh, $49.99, and that's not all. You don't just get the knife. You get the set of steak knives. So that's how it works. The that's not all technique. Okay, um, here's another phenomenon that has to do with persuasion tricks, which is called the sunk cost trap. A sunk cost refers to unrecoverable investments of time or money. So the trap occurs when we continue to invest time or money into something, hoping to get our money back, even though we know it's clearly a losing effort. This is commonly known as throwing good money after bad. The alternative is to cut one's losses and just walk away, admit that we made a bad decision, and say, hey, I'm willing to just live with losing some money. I'm willing to live with wasting this time. But we often have a very difficult time doing this, and we continue to stay invested even though it's clear that we've got a losing um they were in a losing situation. So some of us have likely experienced this if we've had an old car and it starts to have, a, I know I did when I was in college and graduate school, um, it starts having costly repairs. It's generally on the decline. You know, I had an old car that I kept, kept around, kept around and kept around. And the more money I put into it, the harder it was to get rid of it because I kept saying to myself, yeah, but I just replaced this part or I just got new tires. I know I shouldn't have, but I did. Um, so eventually it would just be cheaper to get rid of it. But because I had made several recent repairs, I kept hanging on to it. And then I kept need, needing to have to make more repairs. Um, same thing. Uh, if you've ever, um, if anybody um, ever invests in stock, maybe you have right now, but later in your life, if you've spent a bunch of money on a stock and then um, let's say you spend a thousand dollars and in six months it drops all the way to 100, even though uh, you know you could just sell that stock and take that one hundred dollars and and invest it up uh, elsewhere, but you just hold on to it and hold on to it until it becomes not even worth a hundred dollars, it becomes uh, worthless. So rather than reinvesting the 100, you just lost everything. And we can also think about staying in a bad relationship. Many people do this is to say, I've invested so much time in this person. I know it's going poorly. I don't believe that this person is capable of change, but I've just invested so much. I'm going to stay in it. So um, the tendency to, to, be, to fall victim to these sunk costs is vulnerable to manipulation. So knowing that people have invested considerable time or money into something makes it much easier to persuade them to continue down that same path. All right, so finally scarcity is the concept that something has been that something has limited availability um, or may become um, unavailable. So People tend to perceive things as more attractive when their availability is limited or when they expect to lose access to them. Um, so marketers certainly take advantage of this tendency by creating or implying scarcity to drive interest and consequently the sale of products. So if you've ever seen going out of business uh, signs or while supplies last or limited time offer or there's only a limited number of products available at this price, end of summer sale, whatever it is, 
it's to drive the perception of scarcity and that will make, make people potentially make an impulsive um, decision. And this is not, this is to say real scarcity um, actually it, uh, has the potential to change consumer behavior and drive up price. Like we're not talking about economics and supply and demand. What we're talking about is trying to create or imply scarcity when there isn't necessarily uh, scarcity there, when there's still a supply. Okay, so how do we defend ourselves against some of these persuasion tricks? One is through the process of inoculation. And so this is much like getting a flu shot or a vaccine. The idea is that we can defend against unwanted persuasion uh, if we are given weak versions of a persuasive message um, and have people counter argue against that message. So it basically makes people less vulnerable to getting the strong version of the message. So one way that people can do this, um, I, I do this with my kid, is to say, hey, think about what would happen if um, your, your friends try to get you to do something that you don't want to do, talk through it, what do you do? So I try to inoculate my son against some of the peer pressure that he's likely to encounter by giving a weak message, have him think of what he would say, have some reasons, and then hopefully he is inoculated when that peer pressure situation happens in the future, which unfortunately it, it will. Um, and then another technique is called stinging. And it's called stinging because it hurts, but what you do is you immediately draw somebody's attention to the way that they've been persuaded. Um, so you essentially tell people to say, hey, you were tricked, you were fo fooled, don't you feel a little bit gullible? They, they played a trick on you. And so it hurts, but this stinging technique makes people um, much more resistant to the same persuasion in the future because nobody likes to think like they've been made a fool. Nobody likes to be tricked. So drawing people's attention to the way that they've been persuaded, like, hey, did you notice that that salesperson used the, the, the foot in the door technique on you or the door in the face? Um, they, they tricked you. Um, that people are much likely to be tricked in the, in the same way in the future. Okay, it's also worth knowing that persuasion attempts can backfire. And I think we've all experienced this. It's the feeling of psychological reactance. This refers to our um, uh, be, feeling opposed to people wanting to control us and our tendency and our need to assert our freedom when we feel that other people are trying to other people are trying to do this. So if somebody seems too pushy, uh, if they're driving too hard at a sale, we get suspicious, or or sometimes we get annoyed or angry, and we'll try to like overly express our independence and take back our freedom by resisting whatever the message is. And ironically, sometimes it's somebody that we could actually agree with, but if they're just coming on too strong, that makes us feel reactive. So those people whose job it is to persuade others, whether it's in government or education or business or elsewhere, they need to be aware and careful about this reaction um, because they don't want to have their messages backfire, and so they don't want to come on too strong. As just kind of one a uh, fun example of psychological reactants, there's a bathroom wall study in which researchers placed one of two signs in a bathroom on college in bathrooms on a college campus in an attempt to stop writing uh, for uh, the students to stop writing graffiti on the restroom walls. So one sign said, "Do not write on these walls under any circumstances." So a strong message, a strong persuasive message. The other sign was much more mild. It just said, please don't write on these walls. The researchers put the signs up and then they returned two weeks later and observed how much graffiti had been written since they posted the signs. As they predicted, significantly more people wrote graffiti in the bathrooms that had the strong message that do not write under any circumstances compared to the please don't write. Okay. So similarly, people who receive strong messages against smoking, taking drugs, 
even getting like tattoos or body piercings, they um, uh, become more likely to perform these behaviors in order to restore their personal sense of freedom and choice. So we need to be careful about how strongly we're trying to convince people to do something because that can produce a state of psychological reactance and make people more resistant to our message. And here's just a fun example. Sign says absolutely no machete juggling and this person subtly has the strong urge to juggle machetes. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about social cognition and persuasion. I will be back with another one soon.